thank you for being here. Imagine it's Friday night of this week. The conference is over. You're back at your home, sitting on your favorite couch, finally ready to relax. And you start Netflix, I hope. This is the first screen that you see when you launch Netflix. The interesting thing about this screen is it's not static or universal. It's customized to your taste. There are 125 million versions of this screen, one for each of our 125 million customers. But this one is mine, personalized to my taste, which I just realized is filled with crime shows. <laughs> Let's not read anything specific into that. Moving on. So please raise your hand if you start actually watching something, anything, within, say, a minute or two after you land in this screen. Yeah, not me either. Most of us spend a considerable amount of time browsing the screen, scrolling, trying to pitch, pick something to watch. And that uh, behavior is actually relevant to our discussion today. Let's say it's 10 or 20 minutes later and you're still browsing the same screen. Meanwhile, our personalization algorithms are continuously running in cloud. So we could have generated a new, better recommendations for you in those 20 minutes. And if that does happen, how do we get that new list in front of you as soon as it's ready? How do we tell our application, uh, how do we let it know that there is a better list, better recommendations ready for it to download in the cloud? Push messaging is perfect solution for situations like this. Earlier, our old application used to poll our servers periodically for new recommendation, which kind of worked, but it's not great. It's wasteful, A, and it's not great latency-wise either. What's worse is the twin goals of UI freshness versus server efficiency are in direct contradiction with each other with polling. If you increase polling frequency to get the best possible UI freshness, you're going to load your servers. And if you decrease it to give your servers a breathing room, you're gonna, your uh, UI freshness is going to suffer. Now our client, uh, our server, just sends a push message to our client as soon as it generates a new list for our client. Just as a one stat, we reduced our request to our push uh, our website cluster by 12% when we moved our in-browser player from polling to push. At 1 million requests per second, those 12% add up really fast. So please ignore all push messages on your smartphones for the next 40 minutes because we're going to talk about push messaging. Push notifications are terrible for conference speakers like us, but background push messages to applications are awesome. In specific, we are going to talk about what is push, how you can build it, how you can operate it in production, and what can you do with it. My name is Sushil Aroskar, and I'm a software engineer at, in Cloud Gateway team at Netflix. I have been in Netflix for eight years. I have worked in three different teams in those eight years. And somehow, it still feels like I'm still just browsing the list. The real show is about to start. So let's start with defining push. How is it different than the request, normal request response paradigm that we all know and love? Believe it or not, this is actually from a motivational poster from my local gym. <laughs> That's why I don't go there anymore. But <laughs> it, it is a surprisingly accurate definition for our purpose today. Push is really different in two ways. There is a, a, there is a persistent connection between a client and a server for the entirety of the client's lifetime. And B, there is a, it's a server that initiates a data transfer. Something does really happen on server, and then the server pushes the data to the client instead of client asking for it, which would be the normal request response way. 
we built our push messaging service. We named it Zool Push to send these push messages from our servers to, your applic to our application. Zool Push messages are very similar to the push messages that you get on your mobile, except they work across a wide variety of devices. They work anywhere where our Netflix application runs, which means they work on laptops, on game consoles, on smart TVs, and on mobile. To get this cross-platform capability, Zool Push uses standard open web protocols like WebSockets or server sent events, so or SSE. Our Zool Push server itself is open source too and is available on GitHub today. So let's get a little bit into detail about Zool Push architecture. Zool Push is not a single server or a single service. It's a complete push messaging infrastructure made up of multiple components. There are Zool Push servers to start with. They sit on the network edge and accept incoming client connections. Clients connect to these Zool Push servers over the internet using either WebSockets or SSE as a protocol. And once a client is connected to a particular Zool Push server, it keeps that connection open for the entirety of its lifetime. So these are persistent connections. That distinction is important. Now, because we have multiple Zool Push servers and multiple clients connected to those multiple Zool Push servers, we need to keep track of which client is connected to which push server. And that's the job of push registry. On the back end are push message senders, which are typically our uh, back end microservices, need a simple, robust, but high throughput way to send push messages to our clients. But those push message senders don't really know about all the infrastructure details that I'm explaining to you now. What they ideally want is a simple, single one-liner call that lets them push message to a client given a client ID. Our Zool Push library provides them that interface by hiding all our infrastructural details behind a single asynchronous send message call. Behind the scene, the send message call takes the push message from the sender and dubs it in a push message queue. By introducing message queues between our senders and our receivers, we effectively de decouple them, making it easier for us to run them independently. The, also, the message queues also let us withstand wide variations in number of incoming message. Uh, they act as buffer absorbing big and high spikes of incoming push messages. Finally, message processor is the component that ties all these other components together to do the actual push message delivery. It reads messages of the message queue. Each push message is addressed to a particular client by client ID or device ID. It then looks up that client in a push registry to figure out to which push server that client is connected. If it finds a push server for that client in the push registry, it will then directly connect to that push server and hand over that push message to that server for sending it to that client. Sorry. On the other hand, if it doesn't find a record for that client in the push registry, it means the client is not connected at this time or it's not online. In that case, it just drops it on the floor. Now that we have seen uh, how, what are the different components that make up Zool Push infrastructure and how they operate together, we can actually dig a little deeper into some of them. Zool Push server is probably the biggest piece of the whole infrastructure. Our Zool Push cluster, which comprises of multiple such Zool Push servers, in aggregate handles 10 million persistent always on concurrent connection today at peak and it's rapidly growing. Zool Push Server is based on Zool Cloud Gateway, and that's why it shares its name, Zool. Zool Cloud Gateway is the API gateway that my team owns and we operate it, 
and it fronts all the HTTP traffic that comes into Netflix ecosystem. At peak, Zool push uh, its uh, HTTP gateway, so it handles more than one million requests per second. And it was recently rewritten to use non-blocking async IO, so it provided a perfect foundation for us on which to build our massively scalable Zool push server. But you may ask, why do you need non-blocking or async IO in this case? You, many of you are probably familiar with C10K challenge. Uh, the term C10K was first coined in 1999, I believe. And the challenge simply states you have to support 10,000 concurrent connections on a single server. We have, by the way, long since blown past that 10,000 number, initial 10,000 number, but the name kind of stuck. This capability to support thousands and thousands of open connections on a single server is fundamental to a server like Zool Push that as an aggregate cluster has to handle millions of always on open connections, which are mostly idle, by the way. The traditional way of network programming cannot easily be scaled to meet the C10K challenge. The traditional way is to spawn a new thread per incoming connection and then let that thread do blocking read write on that connection. This doesn't scale because, mainly because you will quickly exhaust your server's memory, allocating 10,000 stacks for those 10,000 threads. You'll also most probably pin down your server's CPUs uh, by doing constant context switches between those 10,000 threads. So it's not efficient to support large number of open connections. Async IO follows a different programming model. It uses operating system provided multiplexing IO primitives like KQ or ePOL or IO completion ports on, if you are on Windows to register read and write callbacks for all those open connections on a single thread. From then on, when any of that connection is ready to do a read or write operation, its corresponding callback gets invoked on the same thread. So you no longer need as many threads as you have open connections, and it, that way it scales much better. The trade-off here is your program, your application, is somewhat more complicated now, because now you as a developer are responsible for keeping track of all the state of all those connections inside your code. You cannot rely on thread stack to do so because thread stack is shared between all those connections. You typically do that by using some kind of event or a state machine inside your code. We use Netty to do this asynchronous non-blocking IO. Netty is this great open source library uh, written in Java, and it's used by many, many popular open source Java projects like Cassandra and Hadoop. So it's really well tested and it's battle proven. We're not gonna go into details of Netty programming in this talk, uh, it's a subject in itself, but this is just to give you an idea from 10,000 feet how an abstract Netty program structure looks like. The channel inbound and outbound handlers that you see here are analogous to read and write callbacks uh, that we just discussed uh, a slide ago. Uh, so this is our simplified depiction of how a push netty pipeline looks like. There are a lot of things going on in here, but I really want to draw your attention to just two of the highlighted methods. Get push auth handler and get push registration handler. You can override these methods to plug in your own custom authentication and push registration mechanism inside Zool Push. Rest of the stuff that you see here, like HTTP server codec, WebSocket server protocol handler, all of these are standard protocol parsers provided by Netty off the shell, which is great because that means Netty is doing most of the heavy lifting here, like passing low level HTTP and WebSocket protocols. Each client that connects to a Zool Push server for the first time has to authenticate and identify itself before it can start receiving push messages from server. As I said, you can 
plug in your own custom authentication. And the way to do that is to override the class that we provide, push auth handler, and override its do auth method. Do auth method gets the original WebSocket connect request as a parameter passed into it. So you, inside that do auth method, you have a full access to its request body, headers, and cookies, which you can then use to implement your custom authentication. Moving on, push registry is the component, as we saw, that keeps track or keeps the mapping of push client and to the server to which, that, uh, to which server the push client is connected. Just like your custom authentication, we allow you to plug in your custom push registration mechanism inside our Zool push server. The way to do that is, again, extend our push registration handler class and implement its or override its uh, register client method. The example over here just stores that mapping inside a Redis. Store in Redis would be the method that you would implement to serialize it, that auth um, mapping into your registry, whichever way you see fit. So you can use any data store of your choice as a push registry. But that data store for the best results uh, should have following characteristics. It should have low read latency. And this is important because you only write a record into that push registry once for every client when it first connects. But you look it up or read it multiple times. Every single time, someone is trying to send a message for that client. So low read latency is important. You can somewhat compromise on write latency if you have to. Your data store should also support per record record expiry or a TTL of some sort, time to live. This is necessary because when a client disconnects at the end of its lifecycle from push server, if it does that cleanly, which will happen 99% of the time or higher, push server will take care of cleaning up its record from the push registry. So it's no longer found. But in real life, you cannot rely on every single client disconnecting cleanly every single time. Sometimes servers crash. Sometimes client crash. Any of this happening will result in what we call living behind a phantom registration record in your push registry. It's the record that says this client is connected to this particular server, but it's no longer accurate because either the server has gone uh, away or the client has gone away. Zool push real, uh, relies on TTL to clean such phantom registration records after a certain time out. Besides these two uh, desirable features, then you have a laundry list of usual suspects like sharding for high availability and uh, replication for fault tolerance. Given these features, any of these would be a great choice for your push registry data store. There are probably several more. What we use internally is Dynamite. It's yet another open source project from Netflix. It takes Redis, wraps it, and augments it with uh, features like auto sharding, cross region replication, and uh, read write quorums. It's another great choice for your push registry. Finally, message processing is the component that does message queue or message routing queuing and delivery on behalf of our senders. We use Kafka uh, for our message queuing infrastructure. Those queues decouple our senders and receivers. Most of our push senders, push message, push message senders, will take a fire and forget approach to message delivery. They use our push library, drop a push message in the queue, and carry on with their work. Few of them might care about the actual end result or status of the push message delivery. And those can get to it, uh, to the final status, either by subscribing to the push uh, delivery status queue, or they can read it of the Hive table in a batch mode, where we log every push message delivery. Netflix runs in three different regions of Amazon Cloud. A backend push message sender trying to send a push message to a client, a particular client, typically has no idea 
to which region that client might be connected. So our push messaging infrastructure takes care of routing that message to the correct region on behalf of our cylinders. Uh, at the base level, we rely on Kafka message queue replication to replicate these messages in all the three regions so that we can actually deliver them across the region. In practice, we have found we can use a single push message queue and to deliver all sorts of push messages and be still below our delivery latency SLA. But if you are worried about something we call priority inversion, our design allows you to use different message queues for different priority. Priority inversion happens when your message of a higher priority is made to wait behind a bunch of messages of lower priority because you are using a single queue to queue them all up. Having different message queues uh, for different priorities guarantees priority inversion will never happen. We run multiple instances of our message processors to scale up our message processing throughput. Our message processors are based on Mantis. Mantis is our internal stream, scalable stream processing engine, kind of somewhat similar to Apache Flink. It uses Mesos container management system, which makes it easy for us to quickly start or spin up a bunch of message processor instances if you are falling behind uh, in processing our uh, message queue backlog. Critically, it comes with out-of-box support for scaling message processor instance number or number of message processors based on how many messages are waiting in the push message queue. This feature alone makes it very easy for us to meet our delivery latency SLA under a wide variety of load while still staying resource efficient. So at this point, I would like to switch gears a little bit and go over some of the operational lessons or tactics that we learned when we first started operating Zulpush in production. Zulpush is somewhat different than the normal stateless REST services that we were used to till then. So it required a little TLC or tender love and care when we first started operating in production. The biggest difference is long-lived stable connections. They make our Zulpush servers somewhat stateful. Long-lived stable connections are great from client point of view, right? Because they, uh, they improve clients' efficiency dramatically. They no long, clients no longer have to continuously make and break connections like they would have to in simple HTTP world. That's why we all rejoiced when WebSockets were finally widely supported and they replaced the hacks like Comet or Longpool. But they're quite terrible for somebody who's trying, from the point of view of somebody who's trying to operate a server. Mostly because they make quick deploys and quick rollbacks problematic. They, make, they complicate it. Let's give you an example. Let's say you have to uh, push a certain urgent fix, right? You have to... Uh, Push a new, uh, deploy a new build. So you do that, now you have a new cluster with a new build in production, but all your clients are still happily connected to your old cluster. Because remember, they open that connection only once when they start up, and they hang on to that connection for the entirety of their lifetime. So they are not automatically migrate to the new cluster just because you deployed it. You will have to forcefully migrate them by killing the old cluster. But then if you do that, they're gonna all swarm to that your new cluster at the exact same time, giving rise to something we called a thundering herd. So this is a lose-lose scenario. Thundering herd is basically large number of clients all trying to connect to the same service at the same time. This gives rise to a big spike in incoming connections or traffic, which is orders of magnitude higher than your steady, normal steady-state traffic. It's one of the things that you have to watch out for when you're trying to build a resilient and robust system. So the way we found our way out of this pickle was to limit a client connection lifetime. All our clients are coded in a such a way that they know to try and reconnect back whenever they lose a connection to the server. We took advantage of that fact and we auto-close connections from server side after a certain period. 
So when the, this client loses the connection, it's going to try and connect back. And when it does so, it's going to land on most likely on some different server because of the way load balances work, right? So this takes care of single client stickiness to a single push server, which is at the root of all the, our deployment and rollback rules. We have tuned this connection lifetime period carefully to strike a good balance between uh, client efficiency that we desire and client stickiness that we are trying to avoid. Not only we limit a single client's connection lifetime, we also randomize it from time to time, uh, from connection to connection. And this is important to dampen any thundering herd that you may still get in spite of best of your design and intentions as the time progresses. I'll give you an example. Uh, let's say there was some network blip, right? And many of your clients drop the connections and they're all gonna reconnect back. So you're gonna get a thundering herd, even if you provide accounted for it. Now the problem is they all connect at around the same time, t is equal to zero, let's say. Now if all of them get the exact same connection lifetimes, let's say 30 minutes, then they all gonna disconnect again right at the 30 minutes boundary from now, and they're all gonna reconnect back at that same boundary. And this is, will go on on perpetuity. So any blip will cause this. And now you have got the only thing that's worse than a th thundering herd, a recurring thundering herd. But consider now, instead of giving them, ex each one of them just 30 minutes, you randomize their connection lifetime by plus minus two minutes, right? So they're gonna get a connection lifetime of something between 28 to 32 minutes, for example. When that happens, for the next subsequent reconnect attempt, they're gonna get a little bit dispersed on the timeline. Some of them will drop the connection and reconnect at 28th minute, 29th minute, 30, 31, and 32, and all the seconds in between. So this has an effect of spreading out that initial peak over four minutes. And when that happens, when they reconnect, they are again gonna get another randomized period. So as the time progresses, it will automatically dampen like the curve shows here. It's a very simple trick, but it's very valuable to correctly tame any thundering herd that you will eventually get one day or the other. This is really a niche optimization, extra optimization. I know just a couple of slides ago I said we auto-close the connection from server side, but it's no longer entirely accurate. It used to be the case, but we flipped it around in our latest version such that now our server sends a message to the client asking the client to close its connection. And I know it sounds like a roundabout way of doing the same thing, but we do that mainly because how TCP works. According to the TCP spec, any, uh, the party that initiates closing of the connection ends up in a time wait state. Time wait state is the last state in the TCP teardown uh, flow. The problem with time wait state is on Linux, that can consume that connection's file descriptor for up to two minutes. Now our server is the one that is handling thousands and thousands of concurrent connections. So our server's file descriptors are much more valuable than our client file descriptors. So by having this roundabout way, by having the client close the connection, we make sure that server's file descriptors are conserved. There is a flip side to this optimization though, because now you have to be prepared to handle any misbehaving clients that won't follow server's lead and close the connection when they are told to do so. To handle such client, we start a timer when we send a close connection message downstream and then forcefully close it from the server side if the client doesn't comply within a set time limit. So with all these tweaks, we more or less took care of the sticky stateful connection problem. And next, we focused our attention in optimizing our push cluster size on reducing the number of push servers that we need to support our traffic. Our big epiphany here was most of our connections were idle most of the time, which meant even with large number of connections open to a single server, the CPU or memory on that server was not under, particularly, under any particular pressure. 
Armed with this knowledge, we chose a really big, meaty Amazon instance type for our push server. We carefully tuned its TCP kernel parameters, uh, JVM startup options, and things like that. And we crammed it with as many connections as we possibly could. Then just one of those servers crashed on us in production. And of course, we got again the visit from our dear old friend, the Thundering Herd. All those thousands and thousands of connections that we crammed so efficiently on the single server, they all came roaring right back with reconnects. You know you have a problem when a single server going down in production can start a stampede in your system. So we licked our wounds, we learned from our mistake, and for the second round, we went with a Goldilocks strategy. Now we know that you don't want to learn, uh, run your servers either too hot or too cold. So we found the server Amazon instance type that was just right for us, which happens to be M4 large in Amazon terminology, which is basically a server with eight gigs of RAM and two virtual CPUs. And with our load testing and switch squeeze testing steps, we figured out that on that particular server configuration, we can comfortably handle up to 84,000 concurrent connections at one time. And if that server goes down, or a couple of servers like that goes down, uh, that uh, instant type goes down, handling those many connections is, we are comfortable with that. That's the size of thundering herd we can handle given our traffic. So real lesson here is you should really optimize for the total cost of your uh, server farm operation and not optimize for low server count. I know when stated like that, it sounds obvious. It should have been obvious, but it wasn't initially for us. Mainly because we, I think we conflated efficient operation with low number of servers. Where in reality, more number of cheaper servers are actually preferable to fewer number of large servers, as long as your cost stays the same. Next problem we had to address was how to auto scale how to increase and decrease the size of our push farm, number of our push servers, as our traffic goes and uh, comes down. Our two main go-to strategies for auto-scaling were either request per second, RPS, or average CPU load. Both of them are ineffective for push cluster because there is no RPS, as we said, because these are long-lived persistent connections. There are no continuous requests. And CPU was low, as we said, um, even with large number of open connections. So how do you auto-scale? The only limiting factor for push server is the number of open connections it's handling at any instance of time. So it makes perfect sense to auto-scale push cluster based on average number of open connections. Thankfully, Amazon makes it very easy to scale on any metric you want, or auto-scale on any metric you want, as long as you can export it as a custom CloudWatch matrix, and that's what we ended up doing. We export number of open connections from our server process, and we hook up our auto-scaling policies to that metric. The last hurdle we had to solve was Amazon Elastic Load Balancers cannot proxy WebSockets. Our cluster uh, is in Amazon Cloud, of course, and they sit behind these Amazon Elastic Load Balancers, or ELBs for short. Unfortunately, ELBs do not understand the initial request that WebSocket client makes, which is called a WebSocket upgrade request. It's a HTTP request, but it's a special request, and they do not understand it, so they handle it as any other HTTP request which means as soon as the server returns the response, the connection is broken, which is not what we want. We want a persistent connection, but you cannot have a persistent WebSocket connection through ELB. By the way, this is not uh, specific to just Amazon ELBs. Any uh, load balancer, hardware or software, that doesn't understand WebSocket protocol is gonna run into the same issues. Uh, that includes older versions of HAProxy and Nginx as well before they started supporting WebSocket protocol. The way we found our way around this problem is to make Amazon ELBs run as TCP load balancers. 
By default, Amazon ELB is run as HTTP load balancer doing load balancing at layer seven. But there is a configuration, there's a switch that you can flip that makes them run as a TCP load balancer, which means they do a load balancing at layer four. At that point, they just proxy the TCP packets back and forth without trying to parse or interpret any of the layer seven application protocol, which would be HTTP in our case. This keeps them from mangling the WebSocket upgrade request that they do not understand. At this point, I just want to note, however, that Amazon has come up with a new load balancing offering called ALB, or Application Load Balancer, which is supposed to support uh, WebSockets natively. Unfortunately, it came uh, too late for us. By that time, we had already figured out all these tweaks to make ELBs do what we want. But if you are starting out today, you may want to give ALB a try. So let's do a quick recap of how you effectively manage a push cluster in production. You want to recycle connections after tens of minutes, ideally between 25 to 30 minutes. That's switch spot that we found. You want to randomize each connection's lifetime to tame the thundering herd as the time progresses. You should prefer smaller number, uh, more number of smaller services, servers, over fewer but bigger expensive servers that will withstand much better in thundering herd scenario. You should auto-scale on number of open sockets rather than CPU or RPS, which are more com commonplace. And finally, if you're gonna put your push, clus push cluster behind load balancer, either use a WebSocket aware load balancer or run your load balancer in a TCP mode, any of which would work. So let's say, if you did all that and now you have a push cluster in production running flawlessly. What can you do with it? Now that we have our push hammer in Netflix, we are seeing a lot of nails. We plan to use it on, for on-demand diagnostic. We can detect misbehaving devices or clients in the field which are generating lots of errors from their telemetry and then send a specific special push message to those devices, asking them to upload their state and any other relevant diagnostic detail to cloud so that we can triage them, we can debug and see why they are causing these errors. And if all of that extra debug data still didn't help, we can always reach, to reach out for the most trusted tool in any software developer's toolbox and restart the application. We can now do it remotely. What could go wrong? But if something does go wrong, now we can send you a message saying we are sorry because we have push messaging capability. <laughs> so hopefully you have some good ideas where you can use push messages too. So I've been talking about more than 40 minutes for around push now, pleading the case for push. And at this point, I have only one single last request for you for me to make to all of you. Pull. <laughs> all of this we discussed, everything we discussed so far is open source. You can find it inside the Zool project in our Netflix OSS repo on GitHub. It even comes with a toy sample Zool push server that you can fire up immediately and start playing with. So give it a spin. File bugs, and if you'd be so kind, maybe send, even a, send us even a full, full request or two. So in conclusion, push can make you rich, thin, and happy. <laughs> Thank you. I'd be glad to take any questions about Zulpush architecture or Zulpush operations at this point. Hello. So Amazon, uh, Netflix have 100 million customer, right? 125, but yeah. So how do you test this? Um, if you want to test some, something, how do you test? I mean, it goes to mobile and different devices, right? 
how do you create, create this message? Meaning? So uh, these are different from normal push messages in sense these are background push messages. These are not mainly, the main use case is not to show something to the user. So uh, for example, the test, uh, the use case I just explained, where you have a new list in the cloud and you send a push message for the client, to the client to download that list. So you can track if I send that ma push message, did that client actually come back and downloaded that list? So all these background push messages have some actions coupled with them that the client takes and we track those actions. And uh, I'm not sure that that's the right answer. And the second part of that question is when rolling out, Netflix lives and dies with A-B tests. So we put a few, like a small percent of client in the A-B test enabled with push. Uh, that cell was enabled for push messaging. And we tested with them. And then we rolled it out to 100% of the users. Hi, um, good afternoon. How does this architecture compare with Apple's uh, APS notification service? Uh, that's a great question. Apple being Apple, I don't have a lot of <laughs> insight into their architecture. Uh, the last I heard is uh, they use some variant of XMPP. It's not really, APNS is really XMPP. Uh, and I think they use Erlang. But, um, you know, at a conceptual level, they are very similar. Clients open persistent connections, uh, and then you have to do all this stuff. I'm sure they are doing this stuff in some other flavor or some other version, and you push messages. Uh, it's just the messaging protocol. We went with WebSocket and SSE because these are open web protocols, and anybody can build those clients. Um. I have a question regarding the protocol. So do you use like JSON or like a binary protocol communicating? So all of the, uh, thanks for your question, all of the uh, current use cases use JSON. But there is nothing in our push uh, message architecture that mandates JSON. So we basically establish a WebSocket connection. Uh, so we support both text WebSocket frames and binary WebSocket frames. So if we want it today, Tomorrow, we could even send like something like a proto buffer or a binary message. Having said that, yes, today mostly our messages are JSON. Oh, sorry. Um, two questions. One is um, how many um, connections per server uh, using how much memory? I th you might have addressed that. Okay. And, this, and the second question is is this only um, used for push or can the client communicate, like request information from? Yeah. Right. Thanks. Uh, those are great questions. So our current uh, server is 8 GB RAM, and we are comfortable pushing that server to 84,000 concurrent connections on a single server. Uh, 84,000. Yeah, 84. Uh, we do operate at a level below that to give us some headroom, so mostly around 72K uh, connections. Um, and the second question, uh, yes, in theory, uh, the client can send something to the server, and there are very few corner cases where the client does that. But as I, as I just uh, went over, uh, this WebSocket connection, it's sticky, so it has all these problems. So we try to uh, keep all the upstream H, uh, API traffic on HTTP, because it comes with all the stateless benefits. Uh, so mostly this is used for communication from server to the client, but there is nothing in the design that precludes sending something up from client to server. We just try not to uh, for architectural reasons. Um, Hi. Um, I'm sorry. You've, I <laughs> you've mentioned that you've, uh, you're, you're disconnecting the clients and you're asking the clients to also disconnect your, themselves. How do you cope with the fact that some messages are going to be lost because the client is at that moment not uh, specifically connected because it's between that that stage, right? So that really depends on client to client. Uh, yes. So most of the clients, for example, uh, the perfect example is again the uh, recommendation screen, right? Whenever client starts up, it's gonna do a first fetch of all the recommendations. So if your client was offline, I sent you that a new uh, recommendation is there for you, and if you did not receive that message. We can safely ignore that because when the client start up, starts up, it's going to do that first fetch. 
So in those cases, it's not a problem. In some other use cases, when you need a guarantee that you can never lose a message, what we advise our client to do is something we call hand over hand transfer of WebSocket connections. So if they have a WebSocket connection and they get a close connection message, we ask them to open another WebSocket connection. So they have now two WebSocket connections with our push server and then the close the old one. The way our push registry structure is the last one wins. So when you open a new push uh, WebSocket connection, that record wins for your old record and then you can easily, uh, safely shut down your old connection. So now you always have one connection open with push server. So you will not lose any messages. But again, having said that, it's just like push notifications, right? Like push notifications work 99.99% .99 of the time on mobile. But if you read APNS documentation, they say it's a best effort delivery. It's not guaranteed delivery. Same is true with Zool push messages. Hi. Sorry, I can't see you. Okay. Over here. <laughs> I'm right here in front of you uh, on the left. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> I'm looking real. Uh, question is, what kind of information do you save? Uh, what, what is the state that you're saving on the back end? And uh, if you do have an upgrade scenario where you need to change that type of state, what information you're saving, how do you handle that switch to the new format uh, that you're planning to save? So you mean what state we save on the push registry? It's simply uh, simplified. It's just two, uh, uh, two pieces of information. So your client is identified either by a customer ID or a device ID or a combination of two. So that as a key versus the internal 10 slash 24 address of the Zool push server that client is connected to. We don't store any other state. And so if you store just that state, it's practically immutable. The only thing that can change that state is your client drops the connection or gets like crashed or something and just goes away. In the first case, it will clear the record because client cleanly terminated. In the second place, the TTL will take care of taking the record. So for some amount of time, that record is going to be inaccurate. But that's not a problem, because the worst that can happen is you, you look up that record and say this uh, server has this client connection. And then you connect to this server and send that server to uh, send a push message downstream. And the server is going to respond, I don't have that client connection. Because the server itself maintains all the client connections against their client IDs in its memory. And server is always more authoritative. So server is going to say, this is no longer correct. And then the message processor will clear the registry. Now there's somebody else. Hi, thanks. Uh, is all of the deduplication handled on the client, or is there something that's done on the servers as well? Uh, you mean deduplication of messages? Yes. Uh, it's mostly client, yeah. We don't. We could, uh, but then you get into the application-specific logic because you have to understand what are duplicate messages, and some of our messages are actually batched. So if I send a message, it doesn't get it there. The second message will have this message plus another part to it. So the deduplication on server side is not really uh, that easy. Uh, you have to understand the application semantics. So we let clients handle it, basically. We do give each message a unique GUID and application message type. And that makes it easy for clients to say whether they got it first or not. I think we are being asked to cut out. We are running out of time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I want you to remember push is green and easy. Thank you. <laughs>